this is lecture 38. of condensed matter physics 1 and in this I continue with our discussion on dynamics of electrons and today I want to focus on what happens when electrons in a metallic system are subjected to a magnetic field we have discussed in detail what happens when an electric field apply is applied. We have discussed about conductivity, we discussed about block oscillations in lecture 37, uh, uh, lecture 36 and now we want to focus on what happens in a magnetic field. So, let me just start by writing the equations of motion. for a black block electron. So, this electron is in a uniform magnetic field. In that case, I have the velocity within all those boundaries that I discussed in lecture 36 is equal to 1 over h cross and I am going to go 3 d today, because the motion in magnetic field does require 3 dimensional uh, trajectories. So, velocity which is a group velocity for the electron is this and its dynamics is covered by change in its wave vector d k d t equals force, which in this case is going to be minus e v cross b. There is no electric field, it is pure magnetic field. Now, this motion of electrons in a magnetic field in 2 d, we have already discussed quite a lot when we were discussing quantum Hall effect. So, let me just ask you to recall our discussion of quantum Hall effect. Where we had discussed in particular Landau levels in quite a detail, because those are the ones that play a very important role whenever a magnetic field is applied. So, also I want you to go back and learn about Landau levels. Now, if you go back and see there that discussion is limited to 2 d gas, what we are going to do today is what happens in 3 d and in the metallic system. Now, again go back to quantum Hall effect so, to motivate I am going to go there and talk about conductivity in a quantum Hall system and what we had seen if you look at conductivity sigma x x, it was almost 0 and peaked whenever a Landau level crossed the Fermi energy. and this had a fixed interval. I am plotting this with respect to 1 over the applied field. So, this was periodic and periodically it was going up. So, the key property I want to take from here is the periodic variation of the conductivity and the period in 1 over b. Exactly same thing happens in 3 d systems.
as observed for quite a lot of properties. So, what would happen is if I plot a property and the property could be conductivity, could be magnetic moment and if you open the research papers, it could be specific heat and so on. If you plot it with respect to 1 over b and I am just drawing a schematic diagram, you see a periodic variation and this period is fixed in 1 over b and we wish to understand this. These oscillations or oscillatory property with fixed period are known as d Huss 1 alpha oscillations and also known as Shubnikov. Dehas oscillations and all these experiments are to be done at very low temperatures and high fields because you, you, you want purity and the kind of energetics that are involved require that. So, now we used to understand these oscillations. Now, this explanation will require knowledge of Landau levels. This has already been done so I urge you to go back to those lectures and it will also require imagining K space trajectories in 3D. So, you have to think make a lot of pictures and, and see how things are going. So, what I want to start with is motion of a block electron in a uniform magnetic field and as I already said this is given by V which is equal to 1 over H cross del K of E K where E is the energy and you also have d k d t equals 1 over h cross, in fact let me write e right here minus e over h cross v cross b, where v is given by this gradient. And these two are enough to give you all the information about whatever we want to learn. So, first things Let me write the equations once more here. V is 1 over h cross gradient with respect to k of E k and d k d t is equal to 1 over h cross E v cross b with a minus sign because charge is minus. So, let me write this as minus E over h cross v cross b. I can also write this as minus E over h cross square grad k E k cross b. So, 
So, two things we can see immediately and that is number one that k parallel that is component of k parallel to b remains unchanged. So, delta k parallel is 0 and 2 that energy of electron does not change. I would expect you to prove these prove these two statements and not taking free electron, but the block electron for. So, you have to use the equations of motion that I have written So, what will happen is that if I apply a magnetic field in z direction, so let us let us fix that b I am going to take b in z direction without any loss of generality. So, k z remains fixed and that is number 1, number 2 electron move on constant energy surface. In particular, we would be interested in motion on the Fermi surface, because that is where all the action is. So, recall that Fermi surface is the one that is the constant energy surface and that is the highest energy that an electron has. So, just, just a note on the side for free electrons Fermi surface is a sphere in k space. So, just, just to kind of get you familiar with what we are talking about. Let me now ask you to go back to lecture 34 that is where I had shown that when you have metals with background potential Fermi surface is not a sphere, because now electrons are not free. So, in k space I may have a surface drawn schematically like this, which I will call a closed surface or I could have an open surface and this extends into the next Boulogne zone. And the energy is constant over the surface, which is equal to the Fermi energy. Uh, the open surface I had drawn there with four protrusions outside, but you know this is schematic, so you can just, just take it like that. Now, when you apply a field in the z direction, I have let us say this closed surface and I apply a field in the z direction this is b, then an electron somewhere here would maintain its k z and start moving on the constant energy surface. How is that movement governed? That is governed by d k d t equals minus e v cross b, which is over h cross, which is equal to minus e over h cross curl of uh, gradient of E 
cross B. So, let me make it slightly bigger here. I have this Fermi surface. I apply a field, uniform field in the z direction. Then at any given point, the curl or the gradient of the energy surface is going to be perpendicular to the constant energy surface. This is grad k E k and B cross this gives you the direction or delta k. So, delta k is going to be equal to minus E over h cross gradient of E cross B delta t, which I can also write as minus E over h cross mod of grad k E perpendicular to the B field, B field and some vector u uh, n which is V cross B term delta t. So, this fellow is going to move on the surface like this. You make that delta k and you will see that. You come a little lower, k z remains fixed and this fellow is going to move like this on the surface. So, it does a periodic motion. So, motion on Fermi surface or any constant energy surface for that matter is periodic. Let us calculate this period of oscillation both in real space and in, in, in k space is going to be the same. Now, uh, before I do that, let me also convince you how to translate uh, how, how this is periodic in R space also. So, let us just translate periodic motion in K space to R space that is the real space. So, this is a geometric connection. If you recall this equation dynamics equation d k d t equals minus e over h cross v cross b, this can be written as minus e over h cross d r d t cross b and this implies delta k is equal to minus e b over h cross delta r cross b uh, cross b unit vector because I want to bring the b outside. So, this is unit vector in b direction. So, you can see right away that k delta k and delta r are perpendicular and they are related by this factor E b over h cross. I will come back to this point once again. So, if I look at this motion on the Fermi surface, this is in k space and look at this trajectory out here. Let me make this trajectory here. So, I am looking at this red trajectory. Suppose, it is like this. When I cut across this trajectory, it is like this B is going in. So, its motion is like this. Let us see how do I translate this into the R space motion. Let me take different points and then we can so that make these points correspondingly on the other side also on in the R space. So, this is the trajectory in K space. Let us number them point 1, point 2, 
point 0.3, point 0.4, 5, 6, 7 and 8. So, I want to now go to R space from this using delta k equals minus E b over h cross delta r cross k cross b. unit vector. For that, let me just go between point 1 and 2, delta k is like this. So, between 1 and 3, delta k is, if I make them small arrows, I at 1 I have an arrow like this, then the arrow becomes like this then like this small arrow, very small arrow in this direction, then like this and then it repeats itself by rotation. At R, each of these delta r since b is going in, this is b, delta r is like this, delta r delta r small, small delta r, then again it becomes slightly bigger. So, if I start from point 1, start from point 1, I am moving in this direction, then I am moving in this direction, then I start moving in very small and then go back like this. this was point 1, point 2, point 3 and then I can complete this. Four, five, six, seven, and 8. So, this was in k space, the upper one was in k space and this one is in r space, b is going in. So, what you notice is that R space trajectory has the same shape as K space trajectory, but it is different in size by that factor E b by h cross inverse and rotated by 90 degrees. So, what I have shown you is that whatever the motion is in k space, similar motion takes place in R space also. It is just that the thing is rotated by 90 degrees and the size could be different. So, periodic motion in k also translates through periodic motion in r. I am doing it for closed orbit. If it is an open orbit, the similar thing will happen and the open orbit will be at 90 degrees to uh, 90 degrees in r space to the open orbit in some direction in k space. So, this is, this is uh, what I have shown you is that this is how periodic motion takes place. Now, let us calculate the period of motion. And this will be like free electrons. I have d v by d t is equal to d v by d k times d k by d t, which if you recall your lecture 36 is nothing but minus h cross by m star minus comes from d k by d t 
times e v cross b and we have already seen that the motion in direction parallel to b does not take place there is no change in k so i can easily write that dv perpendicular dt is equal to there is an h cross also here so this h cross cancels is minus e b by m star v cross b unit vector and this is v perpendicular so you can see that this is typical equation for oscillatory motion right for for dv by dt in free electron is equal to minus eb by m v cross b so the frequency of oscillation is omega c which is known as cyclotron frequency eb by m star notice that instead of m i now have m star and this is cyclotron frequency so time period is equal to 2 pi over omega c i have derived this using motion in k space let's also do it uh, motion in r space let us also do it through motion in k space so deriving and there's a reason for it then we can relate it to landau levels and and you know how things change deriving t by looking at motion in k space and then relating it to geometry of fermi surface so i have dk dt equals minus e grad k e cross b and if you take care of everything h crosses and all that this will be h cross square because i have h cross dk dt equals v cross b and v is grad e divided by h cross so i got a h cross square so when this motion is taking place this is what it is so what you get is dk dt magnitude is equal to e over h cross b magnitude of grad k e perpendicular to b so again let me just make this picture when the motion is taking place like this what matters is the component of this is grad e is this component and therefore this implies delta k is equal to e b over h cross grad k e perpendicular delta t i'm going full circle so time period t would be equal to integration dk over mod of grad k e in perpendicular direction h cross over eb this is how i would calculate the time period by motion in the k space now let's relate this calculate this integral this should be a complete integral over the trajectory now i want to relate area of the orbit in k space to t so this orbit is given like this 
of energy E. Let me take the next orbit of energy E plus delta E and this is at different places has delta k distance at different points it will be different. Then delta E is equal to this is in the plane perpendicular to the B field. So, delta E is going to be equal to grad of k E mod perpendicular delta k. Now, let us calculate the area of this region between two energy surfaces or two orbits of different energies. This delta area is equal to delta k d k integral over the entire orbit. Delta k is nothing but integral delta E over mod of grad k E perpendicular this is from here and then I have a d k. So, this gives me delta A over delta E is equal to integral d k over mod k E perpendicular over the entire orbit and what is this? From here this is equal to E b over h cross t. So, the time period is also equal to h cross over E b d a d e. I am missing an h cross square somewhere. Let us see, uh, this should be d k d t out here should be h cross square, this is h cross square, this is h cross square and therefore, I am going to have h cross square here and I get a h cross square. So, time period is also related to how the area of an orbit changes in the direction perpendicular to the applied field as you change the energy. It is a purely geometric property. So, so d a d e and some constants in between. These two time periods in the r space and k space obviously are the same and therefore, what I have also let me just first write time period we got through r space is 2 pi over omega c which was 2 pi n star over E b and I also got time period through k space to be h cross square over E b d area d e. This is being calculated at the Fermi surface if I want the the, the period for, for the orbit on the Fermi surface and this relates the change in the area with respect the derivative of area with respect to energy to m star. Since, two are the same I have 2 pi m star over E b equals h cross square over E b d a d e and d a d e therefore, is equal to this E b cancels 2 pi m star over h cross square. This is a beautiful result because this relates the change in the area of an orbit to the effective mass of the electron at that point divided by h cross square. 
and now I am going to relate this to area between two Landau levels. Use this to find area between Landau levels. You see, I am using Landau level concept very freely because I have spent a lot of time making you understand what these are and what are the energy levels while discussing quantum Hall effect. Now, the energy difference between two Landau levels is equal to h cross omega c and therefore, delta a between two Landau levels is going to be d a d e h cross omega c and you plug in all the right things you know d a d e we have calculated 2 pi m star by h cross square and h cross omega c. So, this comes out to be 2 pi e b over h cross. So, this is the area between two Landau orbitals let us put it this way in k space 2 pi e b over h cross. For completeness, I want to go over this 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 derivation the way Kittel has done it. So, the same result obtained by another argument and this is given in Kittel. I have d k d t equals minus e v cross b over h cross h cross only and this I have already used to write delta k is equal to e b over h cross delta r plus put it this magnitude and this implies delta k scales as E b over h cross delta r. So, that is the factor that I had also talked about earlier while discussing trajectories the relationship between trajectories in k space and r space. So, area in R space will get converted to area times E b over h cross square in k space. So, if the area in R space is some area you multiply by E b by h cross square that will give you the area in k space. Now, I want you to recall something recall from lecture 13 that area between two orbits of electrons moving in uniform field B is 
phi naught over b, where phi naught is equal to h over e is quantum flux. So, go back to lecture 13 and I had solved a problem using Bohr's summer field quantization conditions. That is precisely what Kittel also uses. Once you know that, then the corresponding area in k space will be e square b square over h cross square times phi naught h over e b and h over h cross gives you 2 pi e b over h cross the same result as we obtained earlier. With all this background, we found the area of the circle of, of, of the you know the, the the orbit, we found how the time period is related to that and all that. With all this, now we are ready to explain the periodic variation of different properties in, in, in applied magnetic field. So, now we explain. periodic variation and this is with respect to 1 over b of properties in a metal when subjected to a magnetic field. So, you apply this magnetic field and you are varying this b and then you see this periodic variation. So, let us first understand when b is applied. In 2 d remember what happened in 2 d we had all this k space states no b and when we applied a b field all these states coalesced into these Landau levels. there was nothing left in between and that gave you the degeneracy of Landau levels also. Again go back to lecture 12 and 13, exactly same thing is going to happen in 3 D. In 3 D what do I have? I have a surface, this is the Fermi surface epsilon f, these are all filled states. you apply a magnetic field. So, this is no field you apply a magnetic field B all these states are going to coalesce into cylinders. So, there will be one energy level second Landau level third Landau level and so on. So, in 2 D they were coming into these circles in 3 D these are cylinders because k z remains the same. So, for a k z you get this energy and the highest energy is obviously epsilon f 
So, the highest energy levels, highest Kz touches the Fermi surface. But energy levels have gone into these cylinders. These are the Landau levels. And if you look at from the top, let me look at it from the top. I have one cylinder, second cylinder, third cylinder, and these are these, these orbits are, are in a plane, and the area between them, this area, we have already calculated. This area is 2 pi e b over h cross. So, let me make it again. Now, the states have coalesced into these Landau levels. Just for completeness, let me show that this is the original Fermi surface. As you increase B, now let us increase B. As you increase B, these levels, the cylinders are going to get bigger. So, the radii increases. Again, recall the radii is proportional to you know the applied field. So, these things are going to get bigger and this k z is going to come down. So, let, let, let us see what happens if I apply a bigger field in the same configuration. What will happen is that the upper cylinder may become a little bigger, lower one will also become bigger and the lowest one will also become bigger. And they will adjust here on the Fermi surface. So, as long as Fermi surface widens or you know uh, squeezes as a function of k z. Let me recall, let me remind you that this is k z. The corners adjust except the Landau cylinders are within the for me quote unquote sphere if you like and this geometry except at places where d a d k z is equal to 0, the area does not change, then the, the, the Landau levels would cross. In this case, Landau orbital will cross the for me sphere if you like. Now, recall from Hall effect, quantum Hall effect, the moment a level, a Landau level crosses 
Fermi surface there is a change that takes place. As long as you have these filled Landau levels nothing is happening, but the moment that takes place there is a dip or increase in something. Hmm. Let me just remind you that sigma x x versus 1 over b at these peaks precisely at the points where Landau level crossed Fermi surface. So, here also we have instead of cylinder we have all these uh, instead of circles we have these cylinders, but they are also expanding in their radii or shrinking as b is changed. So, therefore, the moment that cross takes place there is a change that takes place and that change will take place periodically as you go from one Landau level to the next level. Now, let us see how does that happen. So, number of Landau levels in area A of k space is equal to A divided by the 2 pi E b over h cross. This is the area, this is area between two Landau levels. So, this is equal to h cross a over 2 pi e b. So, let us say the number of levels let us call them n, n Landau levels is equal to h cross a over 2 pi e b let us say n. Then I would have n minus 1 Landau levels when I have h cross a over 2 pi e b n minus 1. And when that happens when you switch from n Landau levels you know you are changing magnetic field the nth level is half filled one quarter filled and suddenly you change to n minus 1 then as 1 goes from n to n minus 1 a change takes place and then you go to n minus 2 Landau level another change will take place. So, let us call this h cross a over 2 pi e b n minus 2 and this is periodic and what is the periodicity? You take n minus n minus 1 is equal to h cross a over 2 pi e 1 over b n minus 1 over b n minus 1. Call this delta 1 over b and this is 1. So, delta 1 over b is equal to 2 pi e over a h cross, which is 4 pi square e over a. This is a cross sectional area in the Fermi surface. Now, this will happen this delta 1 over b is for n to n minus 1, n minus 1 to n minus 2 and so on. Whenever changes by 1 you have this delta 1 over b. So, this is the periodicity. Now, where does this change take place as I argued earlier if I have a Fermi surface this takes place either for the largest cross sectional area because this is where the Fermi uh, the, the Fermi level has to cross or for the smallest cross sectional area let me make an open orbit and then I will have the, the smallest cross sectional area. Or it will take place here 
a smallest wherever d a d k z is 0 this will happen. So, the area that will come into this delta 1 over b will be a largest or a smallest. So, delta 1 over b will be equal to 4 pi e square over a largest or 4 pi e square over a smallest. There is a h also here. I missed that h h h. So, if there is one area, then it is one oscillation, one period. If there are two different areas, largest and smallest, then you will have two different oscillations and so on. So, all properties because properties depend on when the levels are filled and then in between there is a variation. So, all the properties will vary periodically like this. It could also happen the other way this is schematic and this difference is 4 pi e square over a largest or smallest h. So, if you measure this period, it gives you a way of finding out what the area of cross section, largest area of cross section or a smallest area of cross section is. So, if there is only one unique cross sectional area, then I would have this only one a right. So, so check this for free electrons. On the other hand, if I have a Fermi surface like this and let me make it like it is given for copper. Then if I apply field in this direction, there are two cross sectional areas which are large and smaller. Let me make it like this. Then I will have a clear large and small cross sectional area. I will have two periods and the properties would have a larger period and a smaller period. And this period can be used to measure the size of this cross sectional area. If you change the direction of magnetic field, you can get the largest and smallest cross sectional area of the Fermi quote unquote sphere in all directions perpendicular to all directions and you can map the Fermi surface. So, this gives you a way of mapping the Fermi surface. So, what I have shown you is that when you apply a magnetic field and remain at low temperature, so that the, the, since the energy levels involved are very small, you see a periodic variation of properties with respect to 1 over b and that period is given by is related to the area of cross section of the largest or smallest orbit that is possible on that Fermi surface and this gives you a way of mapping the, the Fermi surface. I will be solving some problems related to this for magnetic moments and things like those in, in the problem solving session related to this week and with that I will now conclude the lecture. We have considered motion of 
electrons in a uniform magnetic field and shown that properties of metals vary periodically with 1 over B with period 4 pi square over A largest or smallest H this also gives you a way of measuring Fermi surface and also tells you about other properties that vary periodically. I also must acknowledge here I have benefited from discussions. Thank you.